Hi everyone, Big Mac here. Uh, today I thought I'd give you guys a crash course in contour integration. Um, it's another, this is another math video. Uh, if you're a little intimidated by the title, uh, I'll lay everything out piece by piece. Basically what I'm going to do today is show you uh, what prerequisites I hope you have to follow along this video. Uh, throw in a dash of theory, use a couple of useful formulas, and I'll finish it up with one example. So, prerequisites for this uh, topic. Basically, uh, the kind of background I'm assuming you guys have is second and third semester calculus, uh, primarily uh, sequences and series knowledge, the ability to do differentiations, um, the ability to do line integrals, and to track multiple variables uh, through calculus. Uh, also, you're going to need knowledge of complex numbers, how to operate them, adding, multiplying, converting from Cartesian to polar, etc. Also, a little bit of tenacity is going to help as well. So what's the setup for this? Many integrals can be solved using techniques that we already know, uh, that we learned from classes. Uh, there's substitution, you know, u equals something, du equals something else. There's also integration by parts, where we get our uv minus vdu, but unfortunately that doesn't always work. So here's an example of one where it doesn't quite pan out that easily. We have 1 over x to the fourth plus 1 dx going from 0 to infinity. Well, we would like to try and find some kind of way to evaluate this, but substitution doesn't seem to work. If we plugged y equals x squared in, we're going to have a extraneous x just roaming around. If we tried, I don't know, if we tried integration by parts, we really don't know what to in integrate it with. You know, if this were 1 over x squared plus 1, that would be easy. That's just arctan. If we had 1 over x plus 1, that's easy. That's just log of x plus 1. Unfortunately, that's not what we have here. So we're actually going to have to do something else to in order to evaluate this. So what can we do? As weird as it sounds, let's take x from a real number and transform it into a complex variable. So that, that way it has real and imaginary parts. So we have 1 over z to the 4th, where z is just our complex number now, plus 1, dz. And notice that our curve, that our integral, has changed from a single path to a, or from a single line to a contour path. So why the hell would we want to make it more complicated? Well, it turns out that there are some properties when you take complex integrals that make them really nice. Uh, for example, if a function turns out to be differentiable everywhere, and you can check this, by converting a formula into its real and imaginary parts and using what is known as the cauchy riemann equations to equate them. And if those parts match up, then it turns out that your, your, your then it turns out that your original equation is uh, analytic everywhere. So what happens then is if you take any path, any contour path, any so what happens if you, is if you take any complex path, that starts at a point, you know, loops and winds around and comes back to itself, as long as the path does not cross itself, that integral will always evaluate to zero. So whether it's one really loopy curve or one, or if it's a bunch of line segments, it'll still add up to zero. And the, But the other thing is, what if it's not differentiable everywhere? If there are a finite number of points where it's not, we can work around that. Uh, I just have a couple of pictures here for you guys. Um, I took the example z squared as our function. I wrote it in the uh, Cartesian coordinates version. So we have x squared minus y squared plus 2yi or 2xyi. Um, we have two separate paths here. The first one is a plain circle. That's going to evaluate to zero. The second one, we have a five-sided figure pentagon. Uh, we can do that, and also it's going to add up to zero, regardless of where we start and regardless of which direction we take, which is also pretty convenient. Uh, by convention, the norm is to go counterclockwise. Uh, here we have a slightly different example. We have 1 over z squared plus 9. Um, it turns out it is differentiable almost everywhere, except for two points, and I bet you can guess just where they are just by looking at the function. Uh, it turns out at z equals 3i or at minus 3i, then you're going to have 0 in the denominator for your function, and that's going to be a little problematic. Uh, in the figure, I just have them here marked as red x's. So again, basically, you know, if you have a contour along 
a path that encloses one of those points, then we're going to have to pay a little bit more special attention to it, but we can still evaluate it. And obviously, if our path did not go through either, does not include any of these points, then our integrand is still going to be zero. So how can we evaluate this? If we have a pole, that's what ha that's like a red X right there, 3i minus 3i was, uh, those points are called poles. If we have a pole within our contour path, each pole will have a property called the residue, which we can compute by hand. So it turns out that if we find if we want to find the contour integral, we add up all the residues of the appropriate poles that are within our path, and then we add them up, and then we multiply it by 2 pi i, and that turns out to be our answer. Again, there's a lot more theory that goes behind this, but I'm just trying to give you the short answer, the short hand method. Uh, but again, basically there are two techniques used for finding these residues. Uh, one is grunt work, the other is sometimes you can uh, form it into a series expansion and it pops out really nicely. Uh, so the hard way is to evaluate it by hand. You know, we've got 1 over n plus 1 factorial, the n minus, n minus 1 derivative times f of z, our original function, times z minus z naught, where our pole is, to the nth power. And in this case, nth is the order of the pole. So if you had like z minus 2 all to the fifth power in the denominator, then you would have n equals 5 in this case. So you would take your f of z times z minus 2 to the fifth, take the fourth derivative and divide by 4 factorial. Again, that's a little complicated, but sometimes uh, functions are easier to compute that way. The other option we have is if we can expand our function as a series uh, with respect to that pole. So if we have c sub j times z minus z naught to the j, then basically if we can expand all those terms out, our residue will be the value of c sub minus 1. So you notice that it's a lot like a Taylor series, but it actually has uh, negative exponents as well, where we have a finite number. And sometimes it'll be infinite, sometimes finite, but you know, eventually, but hopefully it all pans out pretty nicely. So how do we evaluate this thing? Sorry for the bad MS paint uh, picture, but you know, we have that our integral is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues, but we also know that it's the sum of our individual paths along the integral. So what we can do here is say we start at the origin, we take c1, then we take the curve along c2, then we head back to the origin on c3, and that would be our path integral, which is 2 pi i times whatever that residue is inside.